Hello, I'm John Molesky, and this is Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My guest today is Robert Daly. Robert is director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States and also co-director of the Wilson Center's Canada-U.S. Commission on China, along with Canada Institute Director Christopher Sands. And he joins us today to talk about rising diplomatic tensions between China and Canada. Robert, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to the program. Good to be with you. So uh, a, a quick recap on Monday, China declared China's or Canada declared China's diplomat Zhao Wei persona non grata and ordered her to leave the country. Then on Tuesday, the day we're recording this conversation, China ordered the removal of Jennifer Lin Lalonde, Canada's diplomat in the Shanghai consulate, saying China reserves the right to further react. And both have now five days as the clock is ticking to exit the respective countries. Robert, when you and I have been discussing over the years U.S.-China relationships, at, at first we danced around the concept of a Cold War. Then as things progressed, we began to embrace that notion. Uh, what's the operative terminology to describe uh, Canada-China relations? Well, Canada is a part of these worsening relations. And as you say, when we first started talking about it, it was limited to the United States and China. But a growing number of countries, obviously Russia and Iran on the China side, uh, much of Europe, not all, it, uh, it's very much in play, and Canada, more on the United States side, are now part of this global dynamic. And persona non grata is probably a, a word that most of our listeners haven't heard or those who have ladies and gentlemen of a certain age, associated with the old Cold War. Uh, this is a person who is not welcome. And tit-for-tat expulsions were a regular feature of the first Cold War, particularly between China and Russia. They've never gone away, uh, but they now are, at least this week, back in vogue. You know, the Canadians had very strong evidence published by the Toronto Globe and Mail, uh, a leak from the Canadian Intelligence Services, that uh, this diplomat Zhao Wei had been involved in trying to intimidate a member of the Canadian parliament, uh, Michael Chung, a conservative member of parliament, who in 2021 was one of the sponsors of a resolution which said that China's treatment of the Uyghurs in Xinjiang was genocide. And the accusation is that this diplomat tried to get information on Michael Chung's family in Hong Kong to intimidate them or pressure them as a way of getting him to uh, modify his views or just shut up. That was the news that really shocked uh, the Canadian foreign affairs circles. So these latest developments, uh, when I was scouring the news of the world, various outlets from around the world, the number one word that kept emerging is uh, deteriorating, deteriorating relations between the countries. How significant is this? Uh, you say there's a, this has been a symbolic tit for tat in an old Cold War paradigm that is reemerging now. Is it symbolism? Is it sort of, you know, just one upsmanship or, or is it something deeper? Well, I think we really need to go back to 2018 uh, when, at the United States' request, uh, the Canadian authorities arrested the chief financial officer of Huawei, Meng Wanzhou, in Vancouver. And she was accused of having violated sanctions and having lied about her company's involvement in Iran. Uh, under the Trump administration, the United States had her arrested, and she was held then for a period of about two years uh, while her case was resolved. She was not uh, under arrest. She was placed under house arrest. She owned two mansions in Vancouver and was free to walk between them and to go shopping and lived as she pleased, albeit with an ankle bracelet she couldn't leave. Uh, to punish Canada for doing this at the United States' request, China arrested two Canadians in China, uh, straight up hostage diplomacy. Their living conditions were very different than Meng Wanzhou's. They were held in cells that were often brightly lit 24 seven. Uh, they were given very little uh, access to their own consular officials in violation of consular agreements. And then finally, although China said this was not hostage diplomacy and the arrest of these two Canadians had nothing to do with Meng Wanzhou, uh, in fact, they were all released within 24 hours of each other. This profoundly poisoned the Canada-China uh, relationship. Hadn't been in great shape anyway, uh, but it had been moving ahead much as European relations were. Uh, the Canadian government had been trying to complete a free trade agreement 
uh, with China for several years. The Canadian people were opposed to it. But during the uh, two Canadians hostages, the two Michaels detention, Canada turned very strongly against China. So what we have now with this tit for tat declaration of diplomats being persona non grata is the latest, you know, irritant to this relationship. Hostage diplomacy. Canada then said that Huawei would not be part of its 5G network. Canada, like the United States, has accused China of illegally operating police stations on Canadian territory. And Canada also sees a growing number of Chinese attempts to influence Canada's, Canada's domestic politics. So this is the latest major irritant in a relationship that has been troubled for about five years now. On the flip side of the coin, uh, uh... How relatively important is each nation to the other? Well, China or Canada has been a major market for hydrocarbons, for canola oil, very importantly. China was trying to get invested in Canadian tar sands fields, also in some Canadian mining of rare earths and critical minerals. They've now been banned from those. China's market means a great deal uh, to Canada's exporters. And uh, Canada, like the United States, has an enormous number of uh, Canadian Chinese, many of whom are recent immigrants, many of whom first came to Canada as students. Like the United States, Canadian universities have become dependent on talent from China and tuition and fees from China. When uh, it was first announced that Hong Kong would be reverting to uh, the People's Republic of China. That happened in 1997, but it was announced in the 80s. Many well-heeled Hong Kongers moved to Vancouver and got Canadian passports. They were called the astronauts. More recently, you have mainland immigrants in Toronto, in Vancouver. So uh, Canadian Chinese are a vitally important part of that country. Really, Canada faces, in some version, almost every... They face the, the, the same aspects of pressure that we have here in the United States. Uh, and all of these tensions are growing. It had been the case prior to the taking of hostages that China was interested, as it has been interested in Europe, and perhaps using Canada to drive a wedge between the North American partners. That appears to be off the table. The Canadians are, uh, if anything, more alarmed than Americans about the meaning of Chinese power for their country. More alarm than Americans, did you just quite, say? Qu quite likely, because of the, the taking of hostages really hit home. Mm -hmm. This was a daily irritant. You know, every every morning you would wake up uh, and and remember that these these two, uh, both two guys named Michael, they called the two Michaels. You know, were both in prisons there, and this was unblinking. You know, tit for tat revenge on on China's part, with no regard. Uh, for the deterioration of Canada-China relations. As far as China was concerned, Canada started it in um, heeding our extradition request. Canada's ambassador, I'm sorry, China's ambassador to Canada, Canada during this period was also very insulting. He said that the uh, arrest of Meng Wanzhou was racist. He regularly accused the Canadians loudly, publicly, sort of, of being America's tools, America's running dogs. Uh, he was a bit of a wolf warrior. Uh, and so the Canadians, I say, are now deeply alarmed and they see this influence. With this latest case of a Chinese diplomat intimidating uh, a parliamentarian from Canada, this is also a domestic political scandal because there, there are questions about how the Trudeau government handled it. Um, when the, the, Glo the Globe and Mail announced this, uh, initially, uh, the Trudeau government said they hadn't known about it. It turned out that uh, high-level people had. It wasn't clear that the prime minister himself had known. So there's a domestic political element of this as well. Uh, prime Minister Trudeau's political uh, enemies are using this to attack him. So it, there's a domestic political aspect of this story. About those uh, domestic politics, uh, is is there essentially a seamlessness between U.S.-Canada politics as it relates to how China is portrayed, in some cases vilified, uh, represented is to voters, or are there notable differences? There's not really a seamlessness. There's There's growing alignment. We have the same set of concerns about China. Canada is ambivalent about America leading in the way that those uh, relationships are managed. For example, in the case of Meng Wanzhou, she was eventually released. 
Canada, within this triangle, Canada, the United States, and China, was surely uh, the most blameless party, and it paid the highest price. Uh, and it paid the highest price because you know we had decided to ask that she be arrested. And there are questions in the United States about how that decision was taken. This happened when President Trump was actually meeting with China's leader, Xi Jinping, down in Argentina. This is when John Bolton was the national security advisor. And he chose, uh, there was a standing extradition request for Meng Wanzhou. Uh, but at the time that the opportunity presented itself in Vancouver, uh, John Bolton chose not to inform the president. So this was not a carefully considered decision on our part. It was highly consequential, especially for Canada, which was a good partner to us. And I think there's a considerable amount of feeling there uh, that we could have been a better partner to them throughout this. Given that we made a deal eventually, why didn't we make a deal sooner when two Canadians uh, were, you know, tra were uh, arrested in China? Things are certainly tense at the current moment, but do you see any pathway to better relations? Are, are there, is there low-hanging fruit between the nations? Are there areas for potential increased cooperation? Not at present. And coming back to the the way I think you correctly framed this originally, uh, it this this is a cold war. Canada is increasingly aligned with the United States views, as is the global West, uh, including Europe, the NATO countries, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and. Uh, all of their relations with China will, to greater or lesser degrees, be managed in the context of China's uh, competition with the United States, but with the global West more broadly. With that in mind, Robert, a final thought. Uh, does it get better before it gets worse? Or worse before it gets better, I should say? Yeah, yeah. I think it gets worse before it gets better. Yeah, yeah th There's some uh, whispers in Washington now of a sort of a, a, a detente of sorts between the United States and China, uh, that we would both like to stabilize this relationship. Uh, neither side wants war. The Biden administration is showing some openness to China's playing a role in a negotiated settlement to the war in Ukraine. So we see a slight shift but I would argue that this is still a shift to stabilize the relationship and have a, a better working relationship with China, but very much within a long-term Cold War context. Well, when it comes to clear-eyed analysis of China, nobody better. Robert Daly, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for your time and interest.